Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm speaking about HIV incidence trends in the general population in eastern and southern Africa between 2005 and 2016 on behalf of the Alpha Network. The Alpha Network is the network for analysing longitudinal population-based HIV AIDS data on Africa. Ten studies contribute to the network, and I'll be presenting data from six of those here today. Um, the map shows in red the districts in which those studies are situated. In Uganda, we've got the Rakai Community Cohort Study. In Masaka, the Chambuliba General Population Cohort. In Tanzania, the Kisesa Cohort Study. In Malawi, the Karonga Demographic Surveillance Study. In Zimbabwe, the Manikaland General Population Cohort. And in South Africa, from KwaZulu Natal, the Population Interva Intervention Platform run by ARI, which we refer to as Mkanyakude. The objective of this analysis is that three studies have recently described declines in HIV incidence. That's Rakai, Manikaland, and ARI, most recently. And we wanted to know, well, in all six studies, have declines been observed but not actually been proven due to a lack of statistical power? The three studies which haven't observed declines are smaller and started with lower incidence anyway. So the statistical challenge in showing a decline is higher there. And so we're using pooled data from all of the studies. We wanted also to evaluate the role of treatment because that's the big change that's happened in the period that we're looking at. In terms of alternative explanations for this decline, or well, we hope we, decline we expect to see, we've included covariates for male circumcision and also for changes in participation over time. The studies had approval from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine Ethics Committee and funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. On to the methods. In all the studies, the regular HIV tests are conducted as part of the research on all residents, and they tend to be between one and three years apart. Observation for this study occurs when the first HIV test is recorded for someone who's resident, and participants were followed up until study exit, which occurred at outmigration, death, or if they were administratively censored at the last HIV test, or at zero conversion at the date of the first positive test. We don't know zero conversion dates, and so these must be imputed somewhere between the last negative and the first HIV positive test date. To do that, we ran 70 imputations, and for each imputation, we randomly assigned a zero conversion date between the last, positive and f last negative and first positive dates. We used a uniform distribution, so we assumed that the probability of zero conversion was equal throughout that interval. We used all zero conversion intervals, regardless of the length and we excluded gaps in residency from the denominator, and we excluded non-resident seroconversion events from the numerator. In terms of the covariates, we are interested in the HIV and treatment status amongst potential partners of our uh, incidence cohort. We don't have sufficiently detailed data on the HIV status and treatment of sexual partners, but what we can do is estimate the HIV prevalence and treatment coverage amongst the group of people who are potentially sexual partners, assuming heterosexual partners um, based on age mixing. And we had three steps in order to do that. The first thing was to estimate the amount of person time spent untreated amongst people living with HIV. We used linked clinical records and self-report data to identify ART initiation. And time prior to ART initiation was classed as untreated and time post-initiation treated, and the ratio was used to estimate the proportion of person time spent untreated. We estimated HIV prevalence in potential sexual partners using an age-mixing matrix for sexual partnerships, which was derived from self-reported data on the ages of sexual partners in each of the studies. We then estimated the HIV prevalence in each cell of that matrix. Then we brought the two things together, and we overlaid the untreated prevalence on top of the estimated HIV prevalence to get an estimate of the untreated prevalence, the likely infectious prevalence, in partners of the opposite sex. The other two covariates were circumcision and participation. Circumcision status was based on self-report, and uh, men's person time was classified as circumcised following the date of circumcision. And participation levels, which we were concerned might have changed over time and undermined any trend analysis, were based on a survival analysis looking at the probability of retesting again in each study round amongst people who had previously tested HIV negative in the study. Those were all included in our analyses as time varying covariates. This slide shows the sizes of the incident cohorts that we used in this study from 2005 onwards. Um, you can see the number of people ranged from just over 4,000 to just over 8,000. 
the number of person years contributed was between 10 and almost 40,000, and the number of zero conversions varies between 30 and 700. The number of zero conversions is determined partly by the size of the site and also by the incidence rates, which vary between the sites quite considerably. This graph here shows in orange the crude incidence rates for men aged 15 to 49 within each study and over time. And as you can see that for these men here, there are declines evident in all of the studies, steep and sustained declines in Manikaland, in Rakai, and in Umganyakude, which have previously reported declines. On the right-hand axis, I have got the untreated prevalence amongst the, these men's potential sexual partners, so that's in women, and that is shown by the grey crosses here. And what you can also see is declines in that prevalence as well over time. This is the same graph for women, so the crude incidence rates are shown in orange and the untreated prevalence in grey crosses. And what you can see here is that there's not such a clear picture for women. We do see sustained declines in Manikaland and Rakai, but elsewhere the incidence appears to be flat and the trend in untreated prevalence amongst men this time is not clear. This shows the same crude incidence estimates, but this time stratified by age for 15 to 24 and 25 to 49 year old men. The blue line shows the 15 to 24 incidence. And what you can see here is that the declines where they're seen are essentially the same for both of these age groups, implying that where incidence has declined, it's done so equally across the age range. For women, again, the picture is different. It's the same two age groups. And what you can see is that the 15 to 24 year old line in blue and the older women in turquoise, where the lines converge and in some cases cross, suggesting that where declines have occurred, it hasn't been even across the age range. Moving on to the pooled analysis. This shows the results of four models run for men from all six studies combined. Um, it's age stratified, so the young men aged 15 to 24 and the older men 25 to 49 were fitted separately. The crude model includes a term for calendar time and a term for study. And as you can see in the results for younger men, there has been a decline comparing 2013 onwards with 2005-2008 with a crude incidence rate ratio of 0.48. Amongst older men, there's also been a decline in that same period, but not quite a steep decline, such a steep decline with an incidence rate ratio of 0.67. In order to see to what extent the declines over calendar time might be have an alternative explanation, we then included in the adjusted model untreated prevalence amongst opposite sex partners, circumcision, and the participation probability. And we see that once controlled for young men, the effect of calendar time has diminished and is no longer significant. What is a strong positive association is with untreated prevalence in the opposite sex. Amongst older men, however, controlling for those factors doesn't change the original association seen between calendar time and um, incidence. Again, the picture for women is slightly different. Um, what we found for women is that we fitted the same models, so for younger women and older women accrued and an adjusted model. And what we found was that the effect of calendar time was different in the three sites where we hadn't seen a decline, Karonga, Kisesa, and Masaka, and in the two sites where the decline was evident, Manikaland and Rakai. And so separate models were fitted for those two groups of sites. And in Karonga, Kisesa, and Masaka, the adjusted results confirmed what we'd seen from the graph, which is that there has been no change over time in HIV incidence among women. However, in Manikaland and Rakai, the picture looked very similar to what we had seen for men. So we saw a decline over time, again comparing to 2005-2008. Um, the decline seen here was slightly earlier for young women in these two studies. Um, it has the incidence rate ratio of 0 0.68, showing that there had been a decline. For older women in the crude model, we saw a similar size decline, comparing 2009 to 2012 with 2005 to 2008, but that decline was also seen in the later period as well. In the adjusted model, again, similarly to men, we see that controlling for the other factors, in this case untreated opposite sex prevalence and participation rates, diminishes the effect of calendar time for young women, but doesn't change it for older women. And so in summary, male incidence has declined, but there's no evidence for female incidence decline apart from in Rakai and Manikaland. And where declines are seen, 
Among young people, you can explain the decline by a change in the prevalence of infectious opposite sex partners, but among older people, that isn't sufficient to explain the change over calendar time. And this could be due to the fact that our untreated measure, prevalence measure doesn't capture that very well for older people. Um, we do know there's a wider range in the age of sexual partners as people age, so we might not be capturing that very well, or it might be due the change over time may have other causes. Um, we've seen mortality decline dramatically in these populations over this same period. It could be contributing to increased marital stability and so concomitant behaviour change. I'd like to finish by acknowledging the, all the, the authors and the many scientists, data managers, field workers at all of the alpha sites whose hard work contributes to bringing together the data that comes to form the alpha network. And I would also like to finish by remembering the founder of the alpha network and our friend and colleague, Vasha Sava. Thank you, Emma. Excellent study, excellent presentation. Yes. Uh, the floor is open for questions to Emma. While people are making their way to the microphone, Emma, can I just ask a question about uh, one of your exclusion criteria? You, I think you excluded non resident seroconversions. Yep. Uh, you, you know, in parts of Africa, of course, migratory work practices contribute a lot to epidemics. Did, did, were there a lot of cases you excluded on, on those grounds, or, or was it a relatively small number? It, so it varies a little bit between the different studies. In southern African sites, we've got a lot more migration, a lot more mobility in the populations. Um, the the non-resident Surrey conversions that I mentioned is more in terms of the imputation process. So when um, we exclude the non-residency periods from the denominator with the multiple imputation process, it's quite likely that some of the serial conversion dates that are imputed fall in a period of time where they, we don't actually have that person in the denominator. So it's more of a mechanical thing there. Um, but in terms of the actual incidence estimates, these are contiguous sites. It's important that we estimate incidence that occurs within those areas. And we can... Um, I haven't done it for this analysis, but it's possible to identify who are mobile people and to look at the contribution of mobility to incidents. Thank you. Mic number three and mic number five after. Thank you. Um, Adam McCoolian from Institute for Disease Modeling. The Umkani um Kude females, didn't see them. And second, um, how did you define, how precisely did you find, define the um, age specific mixing? in terms of, was it on the individual level? Uh, was it a five-year age gap? Um, did you define it crudely? Did you define it um, specifically to, what were the, what were the bins? Um, um, right, so the first question, um, can you could a women was, um, the data weren't quite finalized. We, um, when I submitted the abstract, we went from 2005 to 2014. We realized we could bring it right up to date, but they fell out at the last minute. Um, in terms of the age mixing matrix, so for each uh, respondent, we had ages of sexual partners, and in, I think it was five year age bands, we worked out the age range of their sexual partners. Then the prevalence was done in also five year age bands, and the untreated coverage was done in five year age bands. Um, then we, the mapping then, <laughs> when we mapped that onto the individuals in the incidence cohort, we had broke those down into single years of age for the mapping on. Thank you. Mic number five, please. Yes, please. Hello, uh, David Sorada, Makere University School of Public Health and Rakai Health Science Program. I'm a little bit uh, disturbed by the fact that you do not show changes of incidence with circumcision, especially with older men. And this, this is data that we have consistently produced that there's changes of incidence with um, circumcision, especially in, in men, over time. So I'm a little bit uh, surprised by your conclusion. I didn't show the individual um, model terms for circumcision just for reasons of space. What we found was that if we looked at circumcision, circumcision is protective when we look in the pool model, um, when we put everything into the, um, well, there are several models, but the general thing is that once we put 
more of the covariates in. Calendar year tends to be a stronger predictor, I think because the effect of calendar year is bringing in so many changes that have happened all at the same time. Treatment, other prevention activities and circumcision all rolled together. And it wasn't the primary focus of, our, um, of this estimate. Thank you, Emma. We'll need to move on now. Our next speaker is uh, Mansour Farahani. Um, Mansour is a physician epidemiologist, and for more than a decade he's been working in HIV-related uh, research projects across sub-Saharan Africa, and since 2016 he's focused on population-based HIV impacts. Thanks, Mansour. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of my colleagues in FIA projects, I'm going to present our study on the association of various viral load measures and a recent HIV infection at enumeration area level. UNAIDS pursued the ambitious goal of ending the AIDS epidemic by 2030. To achieve this goal, UNAIDS set a three-part target, 1990-90 by 2020. The underlying rationale for these targets is that the HIV viral load level in blood and semen is the main determinant of HIV transmission. Therefore, reduction of the viral load in infected individual reduces the chance of HIV transmission. Population HIV impact assessment or FIA surveys launched in 2014 are HIV focused household-based, nationally representative cross-sectional surveys of adult and children in 14 high-burden countries. Initial findings from the FIA surveys in nine countries reveals encouraging results regarding the 1990-90 targets. For example, the viral load suppression among those on ART ranged from almost 76% in Cote d'Ivoire to almost 92% in Iswatini. However, the overall question remains as to whether achieving these targets can be translated to a reduction in HIV transmission and in turn to a lower incidence rate and eventual containment of the epidemic. Since 2009, when the first reports of community viral load were published, many studies have used aggregate measures of viral load to evaluate the treatment programs and as a proxy for HIV incidence. Many of these studies have had several known limitations and biases that were causes of concern. Two recent studies addressed those concerns and showed that population viral load and or prevalence of viremia were correlated with HIV incidence. However, because one study used data exclusively from people who inject drugs and men who have sex with men in 22 cities in India, and the other from prospective cohorts only in rural KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa, the result could not be readily extrapolated to the general population. To date, no studies have directly measured the strengths of association between viral load aggregate measures in small communities and occurrence of a recent HIV infection at a national level. Taking advantage of the unique opportunity we had with the FIA data, we set out to answer the following question. Is there an association between population viral load and viral load suppression and the probability of at least one recent HIV-1 infection in the survey's smallest geographic sampling unit or an enumeration area? We used nationally representative cross-sectional data from FIA surveys implemented in Zimbabwe, Malawi, and Zambia. The survey used a two-stage stratified cluster sample design, where the first stage selected enumeration areas from the latest census available in the country. The second stage randomly selected a sample of household in each enumeration area. In this study, we aggregated the data at the level of enumeration area. In the census parlance, an enumeration area is the smallest geographic unit 
which groups a number of households together for convenient counting purposes. In 2015 and 2016, data were collected from a total of 1,510 EAs in three countries. In this analysis, we included data from 1,374 EAs that had at least one HIV-infected adult, consenting to an interview and blood draw. On average, there were 28 households per EA. We used a blood, blood samples from a total of 58,366 adults aged 15 to 59 years resided in these EAs. We employed a combination of HIV-1 limiting antigen avidity enzyme immunoassay and viral load to distinguish recent from long-term infection. Among the 1,373 EAs, almost 93% did not have a recent case of HIV, 7% had one recent case, and less than half a percent, or only five EAs, had two recent HIV cases. We calculated various viral load measures as codified by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, and other groups. We computed the arithmetic mean of log 10 for all the viral load measures. For population viral load, we included all HIV-infected individuals in the EA. For unaware viral load, we included only the HIV-infected individuals unaware of their HIV status. And for in-care viral load, we included people reported to be engaged in care. Lastly, we defined prevalence of viremia as the prevalence of HIV-infected individuals at the EA with HIV RNA more than 1,000 copies per milliliter. Median age of both men and women at EA level was 31 in more than half of the EA, 77% or more, of the adult population were tested for HIV. Median HIV prevalence at the EA level was 14%. In half of the EAs, 75% or more of all HIV infected people knew about their HIV infection. In these EAs, median prevalence of ART coverage and viral load suppression among people living with HIV was 67%. As expected, viral load of uh, viral load of those on ART was the lowest, and that of the people who were not aware of their HIV status was the highest. On average, population viral load across EAs in log 10 scale was 1.9. Defining viremia as 1,000 copies per ml of HIV RNA prevalence of viremia across EAs was 36% on average. Testing alternative HIV RNA cutoff points for viremia in our sensitivity analysis, we did not find any considerable differences when the cutoff points changed. We used logistic regression adjusted for EA level variables such as HIV prevalence, population size, and mean age of the female population to estimate the probability of one recent HIV-1 infection. These graphs illustrate the adjusted predicted probability of a recent HIV infection at the EA level at various viral load levels. In all these uh, graphs, y-axis indicates the probability of having at least one recent HIV case, and the x-axis on the graph from left to right mean the log 10 of population viral load, unaware viral load, and in care viral load. You can see as the population viral load on unaware viral load increases, the probability of having a recent HIV infection increases as well. We did not find any a statistically significant correlation between in-care viral load and the occurrence of a recent HIV infection at the EA level. These graphs shows that the three indicators of 1990, namely prevalence of HIV diagnosis, ART coverage, 
and viral load suppression at EA level are inversely correlated with the occurrence of a recent case of HIV infection at EA level. The three indicators were highly correlated at EA level. For example, the correlation coefficient for prevalence of HIV awareness and ART coverage at EA level was 0.83, and for ART coverage and prevalence of viral load suppression was 0.7. As a result, it seems that all three indicators are equally impactful on predicting the probability of having a recent infection at the EAL. But the effect diminishes as the prevalence of each indicator increases. In other words, half a log rise in the mean log of population viral load increases the probability, predicted probability of having a new HIV case by 13%. Or, for example, when the prevalence of viral load suppression changes from 40 to 60%, the predicted probability of a recent HIV infection at EA level drops by 26%. In conclusion, we found a strong association between population viral load and viral load suppression prevalence with the occurrence of a recent HIV-1 infection at the EA level in three southern African countries with generalized HIV epidemics. These results suggest expanding and maintaining high levels of viral load suppression may be key to HIV epidemic control in these three countries. I would like to take a moment to thank all my friends and colleagues at ICAP, Westat, CDC, Ministries of Health, and all other colleagues in FIA projects for their hard work in data collection and their contribution to the analysis of the data. This would not have been possible without all your excellent work and patience. Thank you. Are there any questions uh, for Dr. Farah Far Far Farahani? Over there. A microphone number, so I can't see the number. Can you turn that around? Number one, thank you. Charlie Jules from Australia. Um, interesting presentation. I wonder if you could um, explain to me what viral load measurements you have been using in your analysis. Viral, is it, was, is it the most recent viral load that's been taken? Is it the single viral load that a person on treatment has had? Or... Because viral loads change on treatment. That's why you use them to assess whether somebody's failing or not. And I'm, I'm, and I'm just wondering what you were using. Yeah. So it was a cross-sectional study. So we had the chance of collecting blood once when we visited, the, when our field teams visited the mm -hmm. household. They were able to collect the blood. So. That the only things that we could measure was that one time that we collected the viral load. You have shown a very strong correlation between viral load suppression and incidence. So do you think your findings have implications for the way countries are monitoring how they're going with um, reductions in HIV incidence? So, just, just wondering if you think this method that you've used based on cross-sectional household surveys is then uh, useful in monitoring incidence trends. You've shown this strong correlation. Yeah, we've, yeah, we've found very strong correlation at EA level between all the three indicators, both you know, uh, diagnosis, treatment, and viral load suppression. This was more than 70% at the EA level. Okay, if there are no other questions, thank you very much. I will introduce the next speaker, uh, Joseph Lamarange from France. is a public health demographer and working at the Institut de Recherche pour le Développement. Uh, Joseph Lamarange is working on the evaluation of combination prevention and treatment program in Western and Southern Africa. Joseph. Thank you very much and uh, good, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, in this presentation, I will explore the temporal trends of population viral suppression in the context of universal test and treat. As you may know, the universal test and treat strategy, 
uh, also called UTT, aims to maximize the proportion of all people living with HIV on antiretroviral treatment and virally suppressed in a community. What is also another way to call it, population viral suppression, which is a combination of the 319. And according to mathematical modeling, uh, UTT will lead to reduction in HIV incidence and potential elimination of the HIV epidemic in Southern Africa. The NRS 12.249 trial, Treatment as Prevention, is one of five international UTT trials aiming at evaluating UTT approaches. It was a phase two arm cluster randomized trial implemented between March 2012 and June 2016 in Klabisa subdistrict, Northeast KwaZulu Natal, South Africa. It was a rural area with approximately 28,000 easy Zulu speaking resident adults. Adult HIV prevalence in the subdistrict is really high, around 30%. Klabisa subdistrict is also characterized by frequent migra migration, low marital rates, and late marriage. On average, only one adult in 10 in the trial area is um, was employed. In both trial arms, HIV counselors visited all local households and enumerated all resident adult household members. Eligible individuals, which means to be adults uh, residing in the area and being 16 years old or more, and who will provide written informed consent, responded to a socio-demographic and sexual behavior questionnaires and gave a fingerprint sample collected as a dry blood spot used for HIV incidence estimation. HIV counselors also offered individuals point of care rapid HIV testing And home-based surveys round were repeated approximately every six months. The list of resident household members was updated and exits, in particular death and out migration from trial area, were documented at every round. All trial participants identified as HIV positive through rapid tests or through self-report as being HIV positive were referred to a local trial clinic set up in the same cluster. All clinics were located at less than 45 minutes walking distance. In the trial clinics of the control clusters, HIV-positive adults were offered to start treatments according to national guidelines in South Africa. And these guidelines were 350 CD4 at the beginning of the trial, and they changed for 500 CD4 in 2015. In the trial clinics of the intervention arm, all HIV-positive adults were offered to start treatment immediately, regardless of the four count or clinical staging. Sorry. The trial area was also served by three local governmental primary care clinics of the Department of Health. These clinics were providing HIV testing, HIV care and treatment, according to national guidelines only. HIV-positive participants of both arms could opt to receive care in the primary care clinics of the DOH or to receive care into the trial clinic. With the authorization of the ethical committee, we were able to link individual level data from the local governmental clinics with the data from our trial clinics. The trial was implemented in 22 clusters in three steps. Four clusters opened in 2012, six clusters in 2013, and 12 clusters in 2014. All clusters were followed until mid-2016. Therefore, the number of survey rounds and follow-up time differ per cluster. Two years ago, we presented the main results in Durban. We did not observe a significant difference in cumulative HIV incidence between trial arms. However, did population viral suppression improve during the course of the trial, differentially by arm? And was it according to trial interventions or according to contextual changes independent of the trial? 28,419 adult residents were registered within the trial. For each individual and each calendar day, we assessed their residency status considering the initial census of the population, 16th birthdays, in-migration events, out-migration events, and uh, death documented through specific exit forms. Daily HIV statuses was estimated using multiple sources. 
repeat blood samples collected at home, repeat rapid HIV tests, HIV positive self reports, and HIV clinic visits, both in trial clinics and in governmental clinics. We assumed a random seroconversion date between the last negative and the first positive observed HIV statuses. And in addition, probability of seroconversion by sex and clusters was used to estimate possible unobserved seroconversion prior or positive status or after a negative one. Clinic visits, art prescription, CD4 counts collected in trial and governmental HIV clinics were used to estimate if HIV infected individuals were in care and antiretroviral treatment for each calendar day, taking into account the fact that some people were exiting care and re-entering care. Among those and treatments, all collected viral loads were taken into account to assess viral suppression, defined here as less than 40, 400. Sorry. The denominator used for computing population viral suppression at cluster level is, um, is a population which is changing over time due to in-migration, 16th birthday, HIV subconversion, out-migration, and death. Population viral suppression corresponds to the proportion of resident adults living with HIV being in care, on treatment, and virally suppressed at a specific moment in time. It was computed at different time points, a pre-intervention estimate considering the situation of individuals at the initial census of the population, and then we computed population viral suppression for each day following the initial census of the population. At baseline, Population viral suppression was similar between arms, but slightly lower in intervention arm. It increased significantly in both arms between pre-intervention and January 1st, 2016, plus 23 in intervention arm and plus 19 in control arm. That increase remained almost similar between arms, although the increase was slightly better in intervention arm. Difference is differences being only on plus four. Therefore, at the end of the trial, population viral suppression was not significantly different between arms, 46% in the intervention arm and 45% in the control arm. To disaggregate effects due to trial interventions implemented in both arms and the effect of interventions implemented in intervention arm only and also contextual, contextual effects, we use a mixed linear model to explore the relation between population viral suppression with calendar time, time since cluster opening, trial arm, and interaction between arm and, and time since cluster opening, adjusting on sociodemographic changes at cluster level and including a random effect on cluster. For that analysis, we have one observation per cluster and per day. This graph represents the coefficient estimated by the model. Population viral suppression increase was mainly driven by time since cluster opening, measuring the impact of repeat home-based HIV testing and implementation of local trial clinics, both having been implemented in all clusters. As already seen, population viral suppression at baseline was lower in the intervention arm. However, the increase was more important in the intervention arm, measuring the effect of initiating treatment regardless of CD4 count compared to national guidelines. The effect of universal treatment was smaller than the effect of universal testing due to the low level of linkage to care within the trial. Finally, there were also some effects due to contextual changes measured by calendar time. In 2015, South Africa changed its treatment initiation guideline from 350 to 534. Our analysis presents some limitations, in particular, population viral suppression is probably underestimated due to the fact that some trial participants receiving care in DOH clinics were probably not successfully matched between governmental and trial data paths and therefore wrongly classified as not in care. In addition, we did not capture HIV care received in private sector or outside the trial area, meaning additional people wrongly classified as not being in care. Overall, 9.5% of, of the trial population had no observed HIV status and was excluded from the analysis. It could induce some overestimation, as we can hypothesize that these individuals are less likely to receive care. However, we did perform some sensitivity analysis not presented here, but results remain unchanged. 
Our first suboptimal, the UTT strategy implemented in Task Charl improved significantly population viral suppression over time. As it was mainly due to universal testing rather than universal treatment, it did not induce difference between arms, explaining the null effect observed on cumulative incidence. Unfortunately, the task trial was not powered to measure if incidence decreased over time within each arm, but only to compare if cumulative incidence was different overall between arms. Changes in treatment initiation guidelines alone are not enough to significantly increase population viral suppression if no additional intervention is implemented to improve linkage to care in this rural setting. Thank you very much, and I would like also to thank all trial participants and people involved within this trial. The floor is open for questions. Uh, Joseph, can I ask you a question? Have you observed any obstacles or stigma among the, those who came for testing and using test and treat strategy? So in terms of stigma, what we observed, um, among HIV patients followed in clinics when we were asking them about uh, experiences of stigma, very few people report experience of stigma. However, in qualitative work, it appears that um, perceived stigma was uh, one of the main drivers limiting people to HIV tests and in particular to linkage to care. A lot of people were afraid to be seen as HIV positive and for that they were not going to clinics because um, in these areas, uh, as it's a separate building for HIV patients, so if you are seen uh, in the queue there, people will, say, will know that you are HIV positive. Yeah. However, on the other side, people were really happy to have services delivered at home. Um, so they are not, there is no fear about disclosure within the household. Um, many people are afraid about social disclosure. Okay. Yeah. I call three, please. I'm Maarten Schim van der Loef from Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Thank you for a nice presentation. Um, so your data are a bit sobering, I would say. Um, in regards to the, uh, the initial modeling paper from Granich et al. in The Lancet. So my question to you is, as a researcher with uh, actual data, was the model wrong or were the assumptions uh, overly optimistic or both? Um, there is two things. The first thing is, uh, I guess, the, the main question in task was probably wrong because the comparison between control arm and intervention arm was only about um, changing the guideline of treatment initiation. What we could see from that trial, and uh, I'm, I'm really up, I can't wait to see tomorrow results from search uh, and from over trial, is that probably what do matter the most is testing and linkage to care. So everything that's happening before people arrive to clinic. For Greenwich model, it will be a very long discussion about is the model good or wrong. The thing is, we were not able to achieve the level of testing and the level of linkage to care that was supposed by that model. Uh, just as a reminder, um, in Greenwich model, if I'm correct, they were supposing that 90% of negative people were retesting every year, and that 90% of people diagnosed with HIV were linking to care within three or six months. Uh, and in reality, we are really far from that level. So basically, you want to uh, hold out the jury about uh, whether the model was correct or not, and you say that the assumptions are, were widely too optimistic. Well, <laughs> I guess it's Rodolphe who said that every models are wrong, but some models are useful. Okay. The thing is, it was an important model because it was changing at some point the policy. I guess uh, three or four years ago we were very optimistic that okay, we just need now to test everyone and to treat everyone and uh, yes, it will be the end of AIDS. And I will say no, it's not yet the end of AIDS because trying to implement universal test and treat is not so easy and there is still a very long way before having 73% of all HIV positive people being on art and virally suppressed. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Excellent work. 
Our uh, next presenter is Alison Hughes. Alison's an HIV epidemiologist at the San Francisco Department of Public Health. Thanks, Alison. Good afternoon, and thank you to the conference organizers for the opportunity to present on behalf of my colleagues from San Francisco Department of Public Health. My talk today will focus on the trends in percent time spent viremic among persons newly diagnosed with HIV in San Francisco. Several studies, such as HPTN052, the partner study, and opposites attract, have shown that virologic suppression improves individual health while also reducing HIV transmission. Research findings have also indicated that sexual HIV transmission increases when the HIV viral load increases. Individuals newly diagnosed with HIV are often viremic, and therefore they're at greater risk of HIV-related comorbidities and transmission until ART is initiated and sustained viral suppression is achieved and maintained. Universal ART was adopted citywide and by San Francisco's public HIV clinic in 2010. It was recommended by the United States National Institute of Health in 2012. There's been a 55% decline in the number of new HIV diagnoses in San Francisco, from 523 in 2008 to 233 in 2016. During the same time, viral suppression at the most recent viral load within 12 months of HIV diagnosis has increased from 40% in 2008 to 85% in 2016. However, a study by Dr. Gary Marks found that single viral load measures such as these overestimate stable viral suppression by 16%. Therefore, we sought to examine viral suppression over time as opposed to a single viral load measure. We hypothesized that the decrease in new HIV diagnoses could be due to a decline in the amount of time that newly diagnosed persons spend at a, var at a level where uh, transmission is possible. We also wanted to see if all people benefited equally, so we looked for differences by demographic and clinical factors. Data from the San Francisco HIV Surveillance Registry was extracted to construct an analytic cohort. HIV is a reportable condition in California, and demographics, risk history, residence, and clinical information is captured at the time of HIV diagnosis. We also receive HIV lab results as mandated by law, including all positive HIV diagnostic tests and all subsequent HIV follow-up tests. Persons were included in the analysis if they were diagnosed with HIV from 2008 to 2016, living in San Francisco at the time of HIV diagnosis, alive 12 months after diagnosis, and had at least two viral loads in the 12 months after diagnosis. Now, because of the dose-response relationship between viral load and transmission probability, we use consecutive viral load pairs to calculate the time spent viremic at three different levels, time spent over 200, 1,500, and 10,000 copies per mil. To demonstrate how this is calculated, here's a hypothetical example where an individual had uh, four viral loads in the 12 months after diagnosis yielding three consecutive viral load pairs or three time segments. For the first pair, viral loads one and two, both were greater than 10,000 copies per mil. Thus, the entire time segment of 88 days was spent above the threshold. Viral load two was 14,000 copies, and viral load three was 500. Using linear interpolation, we estimate that 36 days were spent above 10,000 copies during the second time segment. In the third pair, viral load three and viral load four, 
Both results were less than our threshold, so no time during this interval was spent over 10,000 copies. Next, the days spent above 10,000 copies are summed across all of the segments to yield the person time and days spent over 10,000 copies per mil, which would be 124 days in this example. And this value can be expressed as a percentage of the total time observed, which would be 34% in this example. The same method was applied to calculate time spent over 200 and 1,500 copies per mil. Chi-square tests were used to examine the potential differences between those included and excluded from our analysis. Cocker and Armitage test for trend was used to assess the bivariate relationship between year of HIV diagnosis and time spent viremic. And multivariate zero inflated negative binomial regression models were used to examine the trends in year of HIV diagnosis and days spent above each viral threshold in the 12 months after diagnosis relative to the number of days observed while controlling for the covariates listed on this slide. 77% of the 3,336 new HIV diagnoses met the inclusion criteria for analysis. Persons were more likely to be excluded if they were from an other or unidentified risk factor, 16 to 29 years of age, homeless, or had no known ART initiation within one year of HIV diagnosis. The majority of those included in the analysis were male, men who have sex with men or MSM, and 30 to 49 years of age. 9% were homeless, 25% had public health insurance, and 30% were prescribed ART within one month of diagnosis. Overall, persons newly diagnosed with uh, HIV in San Francisco spent 54% of the first 12 months after diagnosis with a viral load greater than 200 copies per mil. 44% of the time was spent over 1,500 copies per mil, and 32% of the time was spent over 10,000 copies per mil. Time spent over 200 copies per mil decreased from 70% in 2008 to 32% in 2016. In 2008, the time spent over 1,500 copies per mil was 62%, and it decreased 25% in 2016. And time spent over 10,000 copies per mil decreased from 46% to 17%. The test for trend was significant for each viral threshold. Next, we perform multivariate regression to examine the risk factors associated with time spent above each of the three viral thresholds. Shown here is the adjusted regression for person time spent unsuppressed, or above 200 copies per mil. We found that the trend on the former slide persisted. A more recent year of HIV diagnosis was associated with decreased time spent over 200 copies per mil. And lower CD4 count was also associated with spending decreased person time over 200 copies per mil. The following were multivariate factors associated with spending a greater time unsuppressed. MSM who inject drugs, persons 25 to 29 years of age, homeless individuals, and those with a longer time from diagnosis to ART initiation, or no known ART initiation. Multivariate results were similar for time spent over 1,500 copies per mil and time spent over 10,000 copies per mil, including a significant association for the year of HIV diagnosis in the additional two models. Our findings are subject to several limitations. First, we were unable to examine the time spent viremic after HIV acquisition, as we only had information available from the time of HIV diagnosis. Second, our outcome is subject to misclassification. A linear relationship between the consecutive viral load pairs was assumed, which may not always be the case. The estimated time spent viremic may be less accurate if there's a longer time interval between viral load pairs. 
and the outcome may be misclassified for persons who have dropped out of HIV care. And lastly, it's possible there is unmeasured confounding. For instance, we are only able to include ART prescription and not actual adherence to ART. We also weren't able to assess certain social factors that may contribute to viral suppression, such as employment status or social support. We found that CD4 counts less than 350 were associated with spending less time at all three viral thresholds, suggesting that clinicians were following treatment guidelines to prescribe ART with, uh, for persons with a lower immune function. Among those newly diagnosed, 23% were excluded from the analysis because they had less than two viral loads in the 12 months after their diagnosis. Therefore, our results likely underestimate the time spent viremic among all newly diagnosed persons in San Francisco. Vulnerable populations were also more likely to be excluded from the analysis, indicating that the adjusted rate ratios in our results are likely biased towards the null. In conclusion, we found that the time spent above each viral threshold decreased significantly among newly diagnosed persons from 2008 to 2016. The decline in the amount of time that newly diagnosed persons spend viremic has likely contributed to the decreased HIV incidence observed. However, our data suggests that not all populations benefited equally. Disparities in time spent viremic exist for people who inject drugs, including MSM who inject drugs, for younger persons, and for homeless individuals. San Francisco should continue to prioritize regular HIV testing, rapid uptake of ART, and retention in HIV care in these groups in order to decrease HIV-related morbidity and mortality and to decrease HIV transmission. And finally, I wish to thank my co-authors and the staff at the HIV epidemiology section of San Francisco Department of Public Health. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. We do have time for questions, so please make your way to the microphones. Number five, then. Yeah, hi. Um, Joey Aron from Chapel Hill. This really nice presentation. I have a couple questions. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, you chose thresholds as opposed to uh, looking at the area under the curve of the viral load, using a more sophisticated way to, to, to look at viral load. Um, so I wonder if you'd comment on that. And then this also seems like a terrific opportunity to use imputation because you have some missing data, but you have a lot of information where you could use imputation to, to kind of model those people that you don't have, don't have viral loads on. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, there is another measure where you can take area under the curve. Um, for this study, we were really interested in the um, dose-response um, relationship between HIV viral load and transmission, which is why we chose three different cut points, um, all of which have you know different indications, with 200 being the indication that's really what we want people to be at for their own individual health. Um, and then, I'm sorry, I forgot your second well, question. Well, the, the ability to use imputation, because one of the oh, groups that was missing, yes. right, was the people who um, hadn't been uh, observed to start therapy. I think that was the lar a very large percentage of there, missing. Yeah, there was 23% um, that were excluded because we didn't have enough viral loads to um, calculate their time spent at a certain level. But I, I do agree with you that, you know, when we take this... Uh, further, we should include some kind of imputation measure. Yeah, thank you. Microphone number three. Uh, hi, Ace Robinson from the Los Angeles HIV Commission. Um, looking at the data, I just wanted to get a little bit more uh, deeper into your demographics piece. Um, so as we know, like in the United States, um, um, the black community is disproportionately impacted by HIV and usually with, uh, when you look at the demographic portion, that there, there's a, the success seen um, in some populations is not seen within the black and African American communities. Can you speak a little bit um, about like what you were able to see um, as when it came to success for that community? I, I know the data is dwindling as San Francisco has like, really like almost eliminated the black population from its 
um, residents, but um, what have you been able to see from the black and also the, and if you have it, the Native American or indigenous populations? Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so I, there was a footnote on one of the graphs, but we did include race ethnicity as one of our covariates, um, but we didn't actually find any differences by race to ethnicity. So um, black or African Americans in San Francisco did not have um, a different, you know, time spent over these different thresholds. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Alison. Our next and last speaker is Mark Stuv from Australia. Uh, Professor Stuv is head of public health and co-head of the HIV elimination program at the Burnett Institute. He has researched the transmission and impact of sexually transmitted and blood-borne viruses among key population for over 15 years. Professor Struve. Uh, thanks for coming today and thanks for the organisers for inviting me to talk. Um, today I'm um, presenting data on um, time-dependent trends in HIV cascade indicators in, uh, collected from a series of high caseload clinics in Melbourne um, and also presenting data on incidents within those clinics as well. I present on behalf of a large list of authors uh, who represent our Fast Track Cities Committee, um, key leaders, clinical, government and community leaders in Melbourne uh, related to the HIV response. I'll briefly go over the epidemiology of HIV in Australia, which is relevant to the talk today, the local cascade in Melbourne uh, and Victoria, also issues around the measurement uh, metrics in cascades and their sensitivity to change over time, particularly when we reach very high levels. Um, the, I'll go through the methods around the extraction of our data from our high caseload clinics and our analysis strategy, and then results related to uh, what we've seen in terms of changes in the cascade and also changes in HIV incidence and look at some conclusions and implications after that. Um, Australia is a low prevalence uh, HIV country. We diagnose about 1,000 cases annually with a population prevalence of, uh, an es estimated at about 1.13%. Uh, we do have a highly concentrated epidemic uh, with prevalence estimates amongst gay and bisexual men estimated at about 7.3%. And we've been very successful um, due to our long-term harm reduction approach to uh, um, drug use and injecting drug use. We've been very successful in keeping the prevalence of HIV uh, low amongst people who inject drugs. In terms of our local epidemiology in Melbourne, uh, in Victoria, we diagnose about uh, almost a third of uh, national cases, uh, about 300 cases per year over the, over the most recent years. And again, reflecting the concentrated epidemic in Australia, about 75% of those diagnoses occur amongst gay and bisexual men. And we've seen, similar to a lot of developed countries, an increase in uh, annual notifications over the last decade or so. Um, and we've just seen a recent decline in Victoria, which we're hoping is, is the commencement of a, of a longer term trend uh, in relation to some of our responses to HIV. Also, just a note on, on the collection of, of data around uh, HIV diagnoses. They're collated at a state level um, across Australia, a jurisdiction level. Um, but we also have a, a highly urbanised HIV epidemic. We have a highly urbanised population, but uh, HIV cases are even further concentrated within urban centres. So about 85% of HIV cases in Victoria um, are, are diagnosed amongst people who reside in metropolitan Melbourne. So HIV is both socially and also geographically concentrated, which I, again I think has relevance to the data I'll be presenting today. Where are we at in terms of Victoria's cascade? We do have a way to go in relation to testing. Um, undiagnosed HIV um, prevalence, as an estimated prevalence, has remained largely unchanged for the last five years at 88%. Um, we have been very successful in um, continuing to increase the proportion of people who are receiving treatment over the past five years. That's increased from 82% to 95% and also been successful in, in achieving viral suppression amongst um, people living with HIV who are receiving treatment, increasing from 88% to 94%. 
So really, certainly for the clinical care and treatment indicators, we really are at or very close to the fast track city targets, uh, the fast track targets, sorry, uh, towards HIV elimination, but we um, do have gaps in relation to our, our response around uh, increasing the frequency of testing. Issues with the cascade when we start approaching these very high levels um, is they're great for understanding our achievements and our progress towards UNAIDS targets, but when you start getting at very high levels, they're very insensitive to change, and I think that's very important for informing um, our responses and for evaluating our responses. We can implement otherwise very successful programs to enhance cascades, um, but the extent to which um, basic prevalence estimates like this can actually are sensitive enough to actually measure that success is um, pretty debatable. Um, we have to work very hard to get incremental change when you um, start uh, reaching these types of levels. But when we think about the cascade as a prevention metric, really what we're measuring is community viremia, which is a combination of both how many people are viremic in terms of this type of cascade, but also how long people are viremic for. How, how long does it take them to progress from um, acquisition to diagnosis to viral suppression? So really the metric, the key metric, I think, is, is really about the cumulative time people are viremic at a population level, or the cumulative time of onward transmission risk. We have a surveillance system in Victoria and in, across Australia that we um, run called ACCESS in collaboration with the National um, uh, Serology Reference Laboratory and the Kirby Institute. The real benefit of this sentinel surveillance system is that we're able to link episodes of care at an individual level over time, both between services, so we link across testing services, HIV care services and laboratory networks. We use uh, software called Granite, which anonymously uh, extracts um, data out the back of, um, of data systems, encrypts personal identifiers in a non-reversible hash code, so we can identify the same individual over time. And we're able to therefore accurately monitor uh, the timing of individuals' movements through the cascade. Again, as a, I think a, a more sensitive indicator of change over time um, and a, a, a metric for um, estimating or, or looking at um, program success. So in terms of the methods from the data I'll present today, access data um, on HIV diagnostic, uh, diagnostic and viral load monitoring testing amongst gay bisexual men were extracted between 2012 and 2017 from four high caseload clinics, three general practice clinics and one peer-led HIV testing service that see high caseloads of gay and bisexual men. These settings diagnose about 25% of all notifications uh, in the state of Victoria across these four settings. We calculated annualised trends in return testing as an indicator of testing frequency, so diagnostic tests that occurred within three, six and 12 months of a previous negative test. The proportion of HIV tests that return positive results. The time to viral suppression, both measured as a proportion achieving undetectable viral load um, of 200 copies or, or less within 12 months of diagnosis, and also the median time to their first undetectable viral load test um, following diagnosis. And then we also calculated incidence amongst gay and bisexual men attending these services with at least uh, two diagnostic tests over this time. In terms of how we're going with testing, we have seen increases uh, over time in return testing at 12 months, um, six months and three months, and in particular the last few years, um, very pleasing increases in the return testing at six and, and three months. However, in 2016, we also scaled up a significant PrEP project in, um, in Melbourne, and the clinics that we extract these data from were part of the, the PrEPX demonstration project. Um, and PrEP was significantly scaled up at this time. So when we, when we actually remove PrEP participants from this testing data, we've seen, uh, consistent with what I, I demonstrated in the cascade estimates earlier, that we've seen virtually no change over time in the frequency with which gay men are testing at these high caseload clinics. What we have seen over time, and particularly from 2014 afterwards, we've seen a, a sharp decline in the proportion of HIV tests that were positive down from 2% in 2014 uh, to 0.4% in uh, 2017. And also, um, really pleasingly, we've seen large changes in um, undetectable viral load within 12 months, um, increasing from 60% of those diagnosed in 2012 were virally suppressed within 12 months, through to 95.6% of gay men attending these clinics 
in 2016 were virally suppressed within 12 months of their diagnosis. And a sharp decline in the median time between diagnosis and um, undetectable viral load, decreasing from um, approximately 140 days in 2012 down to 49 days in 2016. And a lot of, uh, we, we do have a lot of data showing um, sort of a clustered number of, of viral suppression cases within a week of, uh, within a week or two of, um, of their diagnosis, indicating that approach around um, uh, prescribing treatment at diagnosis itself. And this uh, data shows the decline in incidence over time at these clinics. Um, a very dramatic decline in uh, incident HIV cases amongst repeat testers at these services. Um, and a decline that was happening um, well before we um, started scaling up PrEP uh, in 2016. So, you know, we've seen concomitant ch changes in um, time to undetectable viral load at the same time as seeing um, steep declines in incidence at these same clinics. In conclusion, we've seen those substantial declines in incidence and they've coincided with these declines in um, time between diagnosis and viral suppression. Um, I think what, what I've demonstrated today also is, is having individual patient level linked data to generate cascade indicators is, is excellent for, for producing indicators that are sensitive to change over time. And I think they have greater utility in evaluating biomedical prevention programs and informing strategic priorities. So in Victoria, what are our strategic priorities on the basis of this data? And it's really diagnostic testing. Um, this is a paper that we wrote with our colleagues at the University of New South Wales um, that used data up to 2015, showing dramatic, a dramatic increase in the proportion of HIV cases in Australia that were attributed to undiagnosed HIV, really as the proportion of um, viremia um, you know, post-diagnosis declines, so too does the relative contribution of undiagnosed HIV to transmission. This data was analysed um, you know, at about in, I think, up to 2014, 2015 data, and I suggest that the proportional increase in undiagnosed HIV's contribution to uh, onward transmission is, is increasing um, again on the basis of this type of data. We have a specialist clinics uh, in Melbourne that, as I said, diagnose a large number of, of um, cases. These clinics, clinics are at, at capacity and they uh, operate in inner urban Melbourne, so they also have limited geographic and risk population reach. Where we need to go is increasing um, clinic capacity in low case load settings or HIV capacity in low case load settings and also to develop, develop and support models of HIV self-testing as, as priorities. Um, a large list of uh, acknowledgements. Um, I'd particularly like to single out Michael Traeger, who did the incidence analysis on this study that um, was unavailable at the time of uh, writing the abstract. Uh, Richard Gray at the Kirby Institute, who really leads all the uh, cascade modelling work in Australia, including um, our cascade, um, our jurisdiction-specific cascades. I'd like to acknowledge all people living with HIV. Um, who are increasingly making a, an amazing um, contribution to um, you know, our responses to HIV and to prevention itself. Um, and I'd also like to dedicate this presentation to my cousin, Isaac, who was a, um, a resident of Amsterdam, lived in Amsterdam for most of his adult life, um, and who I got to know very well when I was travelling when I was younger, um, who unfortunately died of AIDS in 1996. Um, yeah, timing... Um, was unfortunate in relation to reaping the benefits of the type of, um, the type of research that we do now and the type of clinical interventions that we have. Thank you. The floor is open for discussion. Okay. Hello. Oh, yeah, Hi. I'm sorry. Number seven, please. Yes. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, toward the end, you mentioned uh, sur your, using your surveillance system and surveillance data to shape or inform different biomedical interventions. Um, and um, I work in Atlanta in a jurisdiction where there are some new uses of uh, uh, linking, for example, electronic medical record data with surveillance data in order to um, relink people, things like that. And I was wondering if your study had uh, any recommendations about uh, how surveillance data is being used or might be used um, uh, 
uh, to uh, either increase adherence or relink people to care, um, or if you personally have uh, you know recommendations on that front about the risks and benefits. Mm. Well, we've worked very hard on this system over a number of years, and um, it takes a lot of work and effort to um, design a electronic um, extraction and linkage system like that we have, well, like we have with um, Access. The key is around the automated extraction of data once the program is installed at sites. Um, there's no need for the site to um, contribute any uh, work at all. We just automatically extract the data and link it again using a, a non-identifiable and, and non-reversible um, hash code. What we are doing, we, we're using this system to also monitor our response to hepatitis C and, and uh, our treatment as prevention approach using DAAs. Um, as part of that program in particular, but also to these high caseload clinics, we also report back um, at an individual clinic level um, to give them metrics as to how they're going in relation to their, to their cascade. And we can make comparisons to like clinics, um, you know, to inform um, you know, clinical service provision at, at a site level, which I think is really useful in terms of um, you know, guiding uh, specific clinics and specific clinicians or areas. Um, about where they might, may need to improve their uh, approaches. So, um, yeah, I, th I think these types of systems are, are excellent for that type of um, that feedback in into prevention uh, implementation. My five, please. Hi, Carly Williams from the US. You hinted at it, but what is the uptake of self-testing? And do you have information when people come in for a confirmation mm -hmm. test? or? How do you anticipate being able to model that? Um, there isn't a self-test that's approved for use in Australia. Um, it's likely that some people are self-importing um, self-tests, but it would be at a very um, low level. I think that's part of our historical problem in Australia is that, um, you know, I don't know, an enormous proportion of HIV tests in Australia are clinic-based uh, laboratory tests. Um, and that's created some real structural um, barriers to high frequency testing when you need to attend clinics during business hours and find time and um, you know our recommendations are for you know um, men at reasonable risk to test three to, uh, four times a year um, and the impediments around presenting at, at clinics to do that is, is significant. I yeah. wonder if you have had data on um, risk behavior or um, in, in people who are being tested kind of over time. Someone earlier asked about the uh, Greenwich model. Mm. And I'm wondering if people who are harder to test are also people that behaviorally are more likely to transmit. So when testing becomes more widely available, people who are health seeking and uh, go and be tested, whereas mm. those who um, are less likely to engage and maybe more likely to be risky are less likely to be tested. So in fact, um, uh, uh, for every person tested, you don't, uh, it's um, inversely proportional. The people mm. who don't get tested are more likely to transmit, and that's why we don't quite see the reductions that we expect. Yeah. Um, you know, I haven't actually looked at that data and I'm unaware of uh, other research in Australia, but um, I actually suspect that it's, um, those at higher risk in the gay community in Australia and, and particularly in the urban areas that are more likely to present for testing more often. Um, I think in Australia we enjoy um, quite a health literate um, gay community. Um, you know, the gay community has been so integral in our response at a community level to HIV and I think that health literacy probably does play into, you know, we have a population that's largely affected by HIV who's you know, broadly middle class, mm. urban, uh, reasonably well educated. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a valid point. Thank you, Mark. Um, and that brings, that brings us to the end of this afternoon's session. I'd like to thank all the speakers for keeping to time and for giving us a series of excellent presentations. Thank you very much.